This promotional episode of the Evening Standards Tech and Science Daily is brought to you by Berghaus and its extreme range of outdoor clothing. We spoke to Mick Fowler, one of the UK's greatest mountain climbers, about his extraordinary career, how equipment has changed in his five decades in the sport, and how, now in his 60s, he's returning to the summit after a battle with cancer. I was regarded as a bit unusual amongst my school friends that I'd taken up this obscure hobby of climbing when there was not very much around London. So I blame my dad. He was widowed when I was three, but he he would um, take me out hill walking in the, the hills of the UK. And he also took me down to the the southern sandstone outcrops to the south of London, doing little bits of rock climbing. I can remember um, pulling away a layer of rock and touching the rock underneath and thinking, I'm the first person that's ever touched this piece of rock. Living in London did have some advantages and one of them was that there was no climbing there and so we were forced to travel quite long distances at the weekend and so we climbed several in the UK things like the Needles Ridge on the Isle of Wight that goes from the the Needles up to the headland and that led on I suppose to climbing in the Alps Um, and we climbed the the six north faces you know the north face of the Eiger and such like in the Alps and it was then that I started to look around for well yeah this is really a great life it's inspiring me to go to all sorts of interesting places. What objectives are there further abroad? I found this calendar photograph of a mountain called Talarahu in Peru. And um, that was the first major, what you might call expedition, that I organised back in 1982. Well, it was four and a half days that we were on the face, and I'd not been on a mountain face for that long before. You know, it's more committing than anything that I'd ever climbed before. We started climbing as a rope of three. It's me and two of my friends, Chris Watts and Mike Morrison. Mike wasn't feeling that well as well, so we, we retreated. Um, I really didn't think that we'd go back up again. The weather wasn't very good. But ultimately, Chris and I did go back up. And we dropped quite a lot of equipment on the way up, I remember. We were not very um, experienced at finding bivouac positions in, in difficult, difficult places. We had a, um, an old Trangia stove, I remember, a methylated spirit stove, which is yeah, absolutely unsuitable for that kind of climbing. And I remember that we, we kept spilling, burning methylated spirits everywhere. There were lots and lots of things that went wrong but we overcame them all and got to the top. We took lots and lots of photographs that I can reminisce over now, but uh, yeah, I, I do remember virtually every pitch and the, the tremendous feeling of elation on, on getting to the summit. And it, it was, it's a fantastic sense of achievement to, to look forward to something for yeah, many, many months, plan something and then actually achieve exactly what you set out to do. Having really never had any health issues at all in life, when I was 60, I was suddenly diagnosed with cancer of the anus and the rectum. Oh, there was a point where I thought that I might die, quite frankly. Yeah. I will always remember the, the discussion with the, the surgeon because they'd realised that the cancer had spread. He said, well, we'll do a... I think it was called a PET scan, and see how far it spread. And then he said, and then we'll see if we can offer you an operation. And I remember thinking, ah, if it's really spread a long way, you won't offer me an operation, and I'm going to die. This isn't very good. And the really weird thing was, I felt 100%. That was the odd thing with cancer. I did. The only reason that I'd gone to the doctor was because I had a bit of blood in my poo. And uh, the end result of that was that I had to have my anus and rectum removed. But in a way, 
It, it's nowhere near as bad as you would think. Yeah, much as the the aftermath of the cancer does make life a bit more difficult, I have to carry colostomy bags with me. It's a bit difficult to sit down, so sitting bivouacs where you're just left sitting on the face are um, pretty uncomfortable. I make a very big effort to avoid them now and try and lie down on my side at least whenever I can. But the clothing kit and everything is really good, so you can stay warm. Things have changed hugely over the years. And for me, I remember, you know, when I was climbing my sort of six north face routes in the Alps, I had more or less homemade equipment. And then by 1982, when we went to Talarafu, I was involved with, with Berghaus back then. And we had Gore-Tex clothing for the first time. Gore-Tex lightning jackets, I remember. And they were just, just such a huge improvement in terms of feeling safe, and feeling secure and protected from the elements. And I think that's, in my experience, pretty typical of Berghaus over the years, that they've always been looking to improve things, right through from super gators to cyclops rucksacks, right the way through to hydrophobic down, and that their latest range of extreme stuff as well. So this year we're off to Tajikistan, where there's a, a mountain there that uh, Simon Yates of Touching the Void fame and I uh, are heading out there to have a go at the north face of a, a mountain in the, um, the Tajikistan Pamir. Now, I don't look round and think nobody has ever seen this view before. Maybe I'm quite selfish in that respect. I look round and I think, aren't I lucky that I am able to get to this position and enjoy this experience? So I blame my dad, ultimately, yeah. <laughs> or thank you, I should say. That was a promotional episode of the Evening Standards Tech and Science Daily, brought to you by Berghaus Extreme. Go to berghaus.com to see the range. <laughs>